and we are recording. So um, I'm here interviewing today from a very long way away, Shumila, which I probably still said again wrong. Um, You're sure right. yeah. She's an ethnomusicologist from Calgary, Alberta. Very talented young lady with a quite extensive resume. She had her song Anticipating featured on Cross Canada Tour for Suicide Prevention Awareness and Hope, featured in top mental health apps, including Shine's playlist on Spotify, World of Stories, um, Alberta Musical Theatre, live stream for The Drop and Tune, uh, CJSW Radio Calgary, Once Upon a Time in Kobe, Japan commissioned by the New Music Edmonton, a PhD in Ethnomusicology from University of Alberta, a Bachelor in Social Sciences and Humanities from Lahore University. And um, yeah, that's, that's not a bad intro. <laughs> so um, thank you for taking the time to chat with me today um, for Spotlight. So, so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so my first question for you, I guess, is when, why, sort of how did you decide that music was something you wanted to pursue in your life? So this, this kind of happened as an awakening for me in my uh, early teenage, when I realized that music was my inner calling. I had been, uh, I, I had started to learn um, Ginans, which is the hymns of the Koja Ismailis, a community from where I come, from a very young age. And I used to go to religious schools and used to sing in choirs and at school, I would lead groups singing other religious genres such as Naat, Hamd, and so forth. But music for me was part of my surroundings, mostly in both in my re religious and secular school. But when I was growing up and there were some bands emerging in the uh, public sphere, uh, I, had, I, ha I was really fascinated with performing music, but the way it happened for me was it came as an inner calling that I wanted to study music and I wanted to um, I wanted to be a musician and when I voiced it to my grand gra grandma and my mother they were there it just came forth one day and they were very much opposed to it because within our surroundings women were discouraged from pursuing performing arts so even when when I voiced that I want to be, I want to be a musician. They, they're just like, shh, shh, don't, don't say something like that. So it was something that I had to suppress uh, for some time. And I was finding a path or a way uh, to, uh, to, to, to move forward. And I think um, uh, I find that life and universe was very gracious towards me because for in the surroundings that I grew up in, this was just uh, this was a uh, uh, sort of chasing a very uh, a very difficult kind of a dream that could have never have come true, but it did come true, and the universe brought it together in a very beautiful way, and I'm I'm grateful for that. Wonderful, and that's interesting too that that wasn't a, a supported thing, right? Um, that's I think common in a lot of people. I always say that uh, uh, no matter what your culture is or where you come from, a lot of people don't see music or the arts as a legitimate career. It's more of a hobby. So I think that that's something that a lot of people can likely relate with uh, on, uh, you know, on that level with you not being necessarily always supported in your, your uh, artistic endeavors. Um, so tell me, what uh, type of music do you currently make and pursue? Like, what's your um, you know, preferred genre, I guess we'll say? Right. Uh, so my my uh, main genre of music is uh, Sufi sounds, and I sing um, uh, uh, poetry of Sufi mystics from the Islamic mystical tradition in many different local genres. Uh, some of them are known to ethnomusicologists. Some are actually under go. Uh, I mean, I, I have done research on them, so they are still also not known to an expert audience in, uh, in studying South Asian music in the West. So some of these genres include uh, Khayal, Kafi, Qawali, and Shah Jurag. So these are the, uh, the, the localized genres of South Asian Sufi sounds that I sing. But I've also expanded beyond that in the sense that I, I'm writing my own songs uh, inspired by Sufi themes. 
I also, I'm also an acousmatic composer, so I work with soundscapes and I have uh, used soundscapes in, uh, from, from my research from the Sufi shrine that I have uh, uh, researched on. Um, my soundscape composition, Forgotten Ways of Thinking, is based on that. Uh, Once Upon a Time in Kobe, which is out to be released in February, uh, is more inspired by my travels it, uh, as part of music faculty. Um, I mean, I was serving as a music faculty at, uh, for semester at Sea Spring 2020 Journey mm -hmm. uh, Voyage, and uh, my, I, I have composed something from that, those recordings. So roundabout, you can say my genres are folk, singing, songwriting, world music, Sufi sounds, and acousmatic compositions uh, that include storytelling and spoken word. Right, which kind of takes us into what ethnomusicology is in itself. Um, I've done a, a little bit of homework, so I'm not going to try and uh, pretend like I know enough about it. Why don't you tell uh, myself and everyone that will watch this what exactly an ethnomusicologist is and really what it's all about as far as you know the study of the cultures and it's far more in depth I think than people would imagine. Yes uh, absolutely so ethnomusicologists I mean, ethnomusicology is a field uh, that is a discipline in music that you know some people say the word itself comes in uh, was coined in the uh, in the 60s or so, but it, it goes far beyond it. It simply means the study of mu musical culture in its context. So ethnomusicologists are not only concerned with the sounds of the music, but also the communities of listening, communities of production, communities of reception that are associated with those cultures of sound. So in short, ethnomusicologists are very much interested in the people who are pe people within cultures who are uh, creating and listening to those sounds and communities uh, that, grew, that grow around uh, particular genres of sound. Now, some of the questions that ethnomusicologists might be concerned with would be how uh, music and its uh, patronage changes with uh, processes of modernity. So some hereditary music communities, for example, lost their uh, patronage when the royal courts ceased to exist. And uh, you know, in, in the world of nation states, how uh, support for these communities transformed uh, the, 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 the way the music is performed and so forth. So there's a there's a large uh, large uh, number of questions that concern ethnomusicologists uh, in in relation to the communities of sound that they that they study. And in if if we were to put this in one sentence, it is uh, this really this idea that they are more interested in the people uh, than simply in analysis of sound, for example. So the community is more important than just right. uh, uh, isolated study of sound. R right, and I, I think I, I, I understand um, that sort of sentiment when you're talking about, you know, it's more about where the music comes from, from the community and culture versus what the end product ends up being. If you were to explain it very simply for somebody who doesn't have a doctorate in or a PhD rather in the subject. Um, no. Um, so that being considered, where did you study and how like uh, how does one become an ethnomusicologist? So uh, ethnomusicologist can you can become one by studying at a university. That's how I started. I pursued my uh, Master of Arts program in ethnomusicology at the University of Alberta. Uh, followed by a PhD. But I must mention here that uh, prior to that, I was in, uh, I was studying Islamic studies uh, in London, UK. And that's when I conducted my first uh, research in ethnomusicology because I got an opportunity to go to Tajikistan and study the Ismailis in Badakhshan and their uh, uh, genres of reciting Maddo. So, uh, an ethnomusicologist, if you want to know where do they start, they start with 
being part of a community and learning music within uh, learning music or learning to uh, learning to learn learn about music from the community. Mm -hmm. So that's when ethnomusicology starts. Well, a university gives you a degree in it, but you can be an ethnomusicologist just by associating and, and, and working with a community. I kind of like that because I, I think that that's a, um, a lot of people see, you know, going through university and everything is kind of a daunting thing. And to say that, you know, you can still feel, you know, connected to the community and not necessarily need the degree that still, you know, qualifies you in the realm. And I, I like that a lot. Um, so now all the things we've discussed, you do a lot of work with uh, suicide prevention awareness, mental health awareness, that kind of thing. Can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what type of work you do and, uh, you know, what, uh, what all that surrounds for you? Thanks for that question. So uh, my work in mental health awareness uh, really comes from um, this, you know, this question that I was posed as an ethnomusicologist studying Sufi sounds, um, that why am I studying Sufi sounds in the first place? What is my connection with it? And I really had to dig deep within me to understand the extent to which Sufi poetry and sounds is uh, an inspiration for me at a very deep level. And when I go and uh, when ask myself, okay, what is that deep level? Uh, I find that a lot of issues that I have confronted in my life uh, that could have pushed me towards, uh, you know, very strong, um, could have pushed me towards the edge. I was able to prevent those because I had the power of music and I had the power of Sufi sounds to kind of keep me centered and keep me empowered. So as an uh, early teenager, that was the first time I experienced um, thoughts of suicide. And it was, I made a very superficial attempt as well. Uh, but while making that, I, I, thought, I thought to myself, I mean, why be obsessed with death and go in that direction? How, how about I put all my energy in uh, pursuing this dream that I have, something that inspires me and music inspired me so much. And I said, oh, okay, I know that I don't have the opportunities. I don't have the formal schooling in music. Probably it's a dream that will never come true, but how about I put my energy into that dream and just go, just see where life takes me. So this is an idea that kind of stayed with me for a large part of my life. I worked with, uh, I supported friends who were, uh, who were uh, confronting uh, thoughts of suicide and had actually made genuine attempts to end their lives. And whenever I had conversations with, 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 with them, uh, give, I found that I carried in me a hope that even when life is not working out, even when things are not going our own way, I just had this hope about uh, mysteries, uh, life being, life being, life having uh, a, a way to surprise us, life having a way to uh, send us gifts and 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 taking us and, and giving us things that we never never thought we would have. So I believed in the sweetness of life in a way, and that is something uh, that I try to give to my friends who were struggling with uh, suicide at, at, at that point. I myself had come out of an abusive relationship that had stigmatized, that had carried a certain stigma within my community. And that got me to, uh, that got me to distance myself from my community as well. So, I mean, uh, the way I've moved forward in life, um, I've always been able to create new paths because Sufi sounds, um, and, and, and the way they, you know, inspire you or the, the way they have inspired me or impacted me, I have uh, deeply connected with my intuition and try to find a new path forward whenever my uh, existing path seemed to be closed or have too many roadblocks or I was hitting walls. So I suppose since past five years, I hit, I hit a roadblock in life again, and uh, I was experiencing dark spots and they have sort of continued. Um, and I've, the, the song that I wrote anticipating, it started, I started writing that song in 2017 while I was going for a walk in Edmonton and the melody and the words came together. And I finally recorded that, that song in 2019, but they, it carries this, uh, this uh, feeling of, uh, you know, pushing the roadblocks and trying to find a way forward 
when you find that there are really, there are too many obstacles on the way. Um, so I'm at a point where I find uh, I'm recording meditations uh, to, uh, to help people with uh, uh, mental health. Uh, and, and, you know, we all are having mental health issues. We all are suffering from some form of depression, some of form of loneliness at this point in of juncture. And I find that uh, the work that I'm doing with suicide prevention awareness is very, uh, is, 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 is gonna, is, is, will, will, will provide support to many people out there. I think we need to work through our feelings and through our, um, you know, sadness with life or despair with life or despair with the eco economy um, in together, uh, because really we are in this together. Yeah. So, uh, uh, oh, absolutely. And I mean, it's never been more relevant um, as far as, you know, everybody in their varying degrees of, you know, again, depression, anxiety, loneliness, whatever. It, as during COVID, you know, it has a tendency to push people to their limit. Um, now, you said that, you know, music has impacted you a lot. But based on what you're saying, it seems as though it also empowered you a lot, like outside, like, uh, you know, the impact was you being empowered to, you know, live your own path and make your own way um do you think maybe if you didn't pursue music that you wouldn't have been able to um you know find that new path like do you find do you find that music is empowering for you and that gi to give you that strength or sort of a for lack of a better term a light at the end of the tunnel to pursue is that uh, would that be fair to say absolutely i i find I mean, there are many times in my life, especially when, you know, going gets tough and so forth. Um, and it's not hard. It's not easy to survive as a musician uh, as such as well. So um, I've always, you know, sort of questioned myself, like, what would life be if I did not follow this path? And every time that I go in feelings of self-doubt, uh, I find that there is universe just speaks to me in some way. I really say it with a lot of conviction when I say that. I don't say it with my academics hat. I say it with my heart when I say that, that music is my inner calling. Because um, uh, there, were, there were things I was thinking about I would wanna do. Like, I mean, there was a period in my life when I was painting and I painted the cover of my first album. It's still not out. It's going to be out in March, and it's a com completely different cover from what I painted, you know, uh, eons ago. But uh, that I the think that music was and has always been my path, even at the level of imagination or in terms of you know the 3D, the physical reality. Um, I don't think I could have been who I am otherwise. Uh, it it is because it's my, you know it's it's my lifeblood it's my path it's it's been my inner calling so I do it with uh, a deep conviction. I think that that's pretty much the only way that you can do this. And I mean, as somebody who came into the music industry a few years ago, um, there's a bit of um, imposter syndrome that you feel sometimes with something that's not legitimized by society. And so you have to find a way to empower yourself or encircle your people, uh, yourself with people that help empower you to chase down those things. Cause you know, again, not everybody thinks it's such a great life choice. And, and I know that a lot of people in the arts and music and whatever suffer from that. I call it imposter syndrome. I don't know if it's a real thing or not, might be, but I know a lot of people feel it. Um, so all those things being said, you have, a very mm -hmm. impressive bio and accolades. What do you consider to be your greatest achievement um, through music? You know, um, academics is one thing, but what do you think your greatest musical achievement is? That's a great question. Uh, I find that there is not a single uh, achievement that I can point towards. Uh, I find that there is, there have been a series of, let's say, awakenings for me in music, starting with uh, my performance at the Pakistan American Cultural Center where I performed with my Ustad in 2014. And then in 2015, I performed with a, a group of musicians as part of World Music Residency at the Banff Arts Center. Uh, that, was, uh, that was for me one of those breakthrough performances. And then 
that got followed by a lot of amazing uh, gifts that I received. I think last year was quite amazing because I, uh, uh, I led a zikr at, uh, I, I led a zikr on the World Odyssey uh, while I was teaching as part of uh, uh, teaching as a music faculty. And after that, uh, the song Anticipating that was recorded and released in late 2019 uh, was featured on the Cross Canada Tour for Suicide Prevention Awareness and Hope. And that's when I found my music has started to create the impact that I always thought that, you know, is, is my vision, is my purpose. Um, and uh, with, uh, with, 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 with these upcoming releases, such as Manat, um, I find that um, uh, it's, it's leading towards uh, realizing my purpose through music. Yeah. That, I, I like that because staying, it, it's hard to talk about yourself, but I, I think it's important to for a person to acknowledge their um, uh, uh, achievements and successes um, as much as it is to acknowledge and move from, you know, failures and mistakes. So I think that that's, uh, uh, thank you for, uh, you know, having something that you're, you're proud of and, uh, you know, take a, just a moment to let go of the, the humility and just, you know, praise yourself for a moment. I like that. Um, upcoming projects. I know I, I normally talk about tours and shows, obviously right now with COVID, there's not a lot of that happening. Um, tell us about your single and where we'll be able to find it or your release and where we'll be able to find it. Right, so my single Bedadi, uh, which means awakening, it's coming out uh, on Friday and it will be available on all digital platforms. The language of this particular song is Urdu, uh, but I will, I will post uh, lyrics in English. And that's one of the recent releases that are coming out, followed by Once Upon a Time in Kobe, Japan. And that would be part of New Music Edmonton's podcast. Um, and uh, that would be available also online on New Music Edmonton's website. And after that, uh, finally, I will be releasing my album, uh, Manat, uh, which is supported by Edmonton Arts Council's Cultural Diversity Award. And that would be available from my, you can pre-order it from my website, as well as, you know, it would be available on all digital platforms. Uh, and it's coming out uh, on March 19th. So these are some releases that I have planned. Excellent. Um, so anybody you'd like to thank you know, a shout out to some friends or people that have supported you along the way or on the uh, on the 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 um, maybe somebody that you, you know, would like to dedicate some, you know, all the work you've done, anything you'd like um, to thank anybody you have your your moment to say thank you. Great. So I have a lot of people to thank. I would like to thank the Edmonton community for their support. Um, I, amongst organizations, I would like to thank Alberta Musical Theatre, I would like to thank Canada's Music in Incubator, um, CJSW and New York, New York Calgary Femway Festival, New Music Edmonton, and most, uh, most of all my professors at the University of Alberta, Dr. Regula Qureshi and Dr. Michael Fishko uh, Fishkoff, and Dr. Uh, Maria Moshavar, they've always been very, very supportive to, in my journey. I would like to thank my brother and my mom, and they have been super great uh, uh, and have been very supportive. And um, finally, I would like to uh, say thank you to my uh, Ustad in Bhiksha, in Sin, Fakir Jumansha, as well as my late Ustad, Hamid Ali Khan Saeed from Gwalior Grana, who uh, passed away last, last year in August uh, 2019, uh, two years ago now, uh, but um, he's he's someone that I miss very much, and I thank from the bottom of my heart. Yeah. Wonderful, uh, Shumaila, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us and tell us all the great stuff you're doing. Um, everybody, you'll be able to see this interview on Spotlight for Starlight Sessions. Um, we'll have all the links to all of her uh, um, Spotify. Facebook, her websites, all of her stuff in the in the post here. And just thank you so much, Jumaila. And we hope to uh, hear from you again in the not too distant future. Thank you for having me. Okay, thanks.